Testament judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. The story of a man that's very famous from Scripture. We just about everybody's heard of him. We've all read the stories of Samson. But I think we're going to get a little bit different a perspective out of the word that God has laid in my spirit for today. Judges chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read 1 through 7, then we're going to follow that by jumping down to verses 24 and 25. And that's just so we're not reading the whole thing, you know, but we're going to read Judges 13, 1 through 7, and then I'll leap down to verses 24 and 25. If you'd stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and the Word of the Lord declares, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for forty years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Verses 24 and 25. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahune, then between Zorah and Estriel. Master, we love you today. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of your spirit that we felt in this place as our faith is reaching out to you today for great things on behalf of Emily's stepdad. Master, in the name of Jesus, as the word of God would go forth at this hour, we ask that the anointing would rest upon your messenger. Help me, God, to declare the word of God boldly and plainly and clearly that all might hear and receive and be benefited by all that you would have them to know at this hour. For we ask it in none others. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Samson had a very special and a very unique relationship with the Lord that began even before his birth. Interestingly enough, Samson was thrust into a life of deep dedication and service. He never had a choice. He never had any say in the matter. There were many things that Samson would have to observe in his lifetime. There were many prohibitions that Samson would have to observe during his lifetime, including the prohibition relative to the cutting of his hair. And all of this because God had put a calling on Samson before Samson had ever been conceived. Did you hear me now? It wasn't even a matter of God did this before Samson was born. Samson hadn't even yet been conceived. 
because the Lord has come to tell Samson's mother, you will conceive. So obviously she hadn't conceived yet. But you see, folks don't understand that God knows who you are. He knows everything about you. He knows what makes you tick. Honey, He knew it before you were born, but even before that, He knew it before you were even conceived. Amen. Some people say, well, you're an affirming minister, so do you have a permissive uh, attitude or belief about the issue of abortion? Honestly, I'll tell you, I'll open a huge can of worms here. I do not agree with the concept of abortion. And I believe that if people would behave responsibly and act right and do what was necessary before conception, abortion would be unnecessary. But I think that unfortunately abortion is the avenue that many turn to when they're playing their lives fast, cheap, and easy and they're not wanting to take responsibility before something happens, and therefore they feel like, well, I always have the option of just tossing this out with the trash after something has happened. But you see, if God could know Samson and have a call on Samson's life before Samson was even conceived, then surely he knows. <laughs> What's in store for that child that's in a young lady's womb? And it troubles me that people are throwing these children away. You see, some preachers will tell you that according to Scripture, all children go to heaven because they haven't reached the age of accountability. That is not scriptural, people. I'm telling you right now, it's not scriptural. There, you will not ever in the scriptures find one time the words age of accountability. They're not there. Where were the children in the days of Noah when the flood came upon the earth? They died with their parents. Where were Noah's children? They were saved with their parents. Where were the children in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and her sister cities when they were destroyed by fire? They were destroyed with their parents. Where were Lot's children? They were spared with Lot. Do you see a pattern going on here? The Bible said, Else your children were unclean, but now they are holy, Paul was speaking to believing parents. He said, your children are sanctified by believing parents. God's Word never fails. It can't fail. That's why I said, if you raise up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. And God says, therefore, I say, if you're raising your child right, I know ahead of time they're going to be okay in the end. So that child is sanctified by the believing parent. The scripture also tells us that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. Haven't you ever wondered sometimes why there can be people who are in who are coupled? One of them is a godly person, the other one that can be the worst, most ungodly sinner that ever walked the face of the earth, and yet you see them as a couple experiencing great blessing. Amen. You see them as a couple being blessed of God. Why? God didn't give that husband all that overtime because he was a godly man. God didn't give that husband overtime because he was a righteous man. No. God gave that husband overtime so that wife could eat. Because the unsaved spouse is sanctified or set apart for blessing by God because of the saved spouse. You follow me? Well, now, having said that, 
Here's the dilemma. The scripture said in the last days, hell hath enlarged itself to accommodate the souls of men that are pouring into it faster than it can accommodate. Children, when an unbelieving mother throws that child away, she is filling hell's belly. Did you hear me? That's why Satan chuckles at the concept of abortion. That's why he just thinks it's a funny that human beings are stupid enough to so devalue life that they'd be willing to take a human form and throw it away like it's an old sponge. You see that? See, it's one thing if you're a believing person and your child, you have a miscarriage or you have, a, you know, something of that sort, because that that child was sanctified by your faith. Until they're old enough to make a decision for themselves, they're under your umbrella as a parent. No such thing as age of accountability. That don't exist. But until they are capable of making a decision for themselves, you are responsible for their salvation. You are responsible for their spiritual well-being. How do you like that now? Well, I said all that, I have no idea why. I guess somebody that's going to hear this by tape is going to need to understand the principles that I'm talking about. And if it saves any lives, then God willing, God grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, turn something evil and awful into something good. Give that child a chance at life. There are so many parents that are out there that want children. And believe me, there are some good people. There are some wealthy people. I mean, people who can give that child a good life, you know. So give that child an opportunity at life. Samson was born under the, the vow of a Nazarite. Many people try to describe the Lord Jesus as being a long-haired man with a beard and so on and so forth. And the premise that they're operating on is that the Lord was a Nazarite. And this was part of the vow of a Nazarite. Uh, children, let me tell you know something again. Being from Nazareth did not make you a Nazarite. It made you a Nazarene. That's why we call Jesus the Nazarene. A Nazarite was an individual who took a very specific vow to live consecrated unto the Lord and dedicated unto the Lord, and Jesus was not a Nazarite. So his hair could he could he ever been as been as short as mine for all we know. But a Nazarite, part of his vow was that he would not let scissors come to his hair. He had to go his entire lifetime without ever cutting his hair. That was part of the vow of a Nazarite. When we hear the story of Samson, a lot of times we're told the story in such a fashion that it almost sounds as though his hair possessed some magic powers. And that if he lost his hair, he lost his power. No, if he lost his hair, he broke his vow. See, sometimes we put confidence in things where confidence doesn't belong. Sometimes we've got people that live their lives and they think, Laura, that they're going to stand before God justified in the judgment because of the length of her hair or because of the length of her skirt or because she goes to this particular church or because they go to this particular denomination or organization, or because they don't observe holidays, or because they don't eat this, or because they don't do that. And they put their confidence in the things that they do or they don't do, the things that they embrace or they don't embrace, the things that they wear or they don't wear, and they do so the same way that Samson had his confidence in his locks. 
When in reality his confidence ought never to have been in his looks, his confidence ought always to have been in his God. Because as, you, as we read today in the, the uh, text that I gave you, in the final verse, the Bible said, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move mightily upon Samson at this time. So you see, there was nothing going on with Samson's hair. It wasn't about his hair. It was about the anointing of God that Samson had on his life. But it's so easy to get caught up in all the accoutrements and all the externals and all the things that are visible to us that constitute religion the rules and the regulations, and we begin to put our confidence in those things to be doing those things for. Amen. Samson, you see, there, there's a reason Samson kind of lost sight of all that, like I told you, because A, Samson was born into this thing. He never chose it. You're born into a church sometimes, and you're told, this is the way you do, this is what you do. You don't do this, and you don't do that. You do do this, and you do do that. You don't eat this, and you don't eat that. And people tell you all the externals. They give you all the rules, all the regulation, like Samson. You cannot cut your hair. Samson, for the rest of your life, you cannot cut your hair. And you hear all the rules and all the regulations, but you know what? All those rules and regulations don't do a thing to bring you closer to God. But you're told that they will. If you do all these things, you'll be closer to God. You'll be, you'll be more what God wants you to be. You'll be, you'll be more uh, something He can love and something He can accept and something He can receive. If you follow all these rules, you, all these things, then you'll be closer to God. Just like Samson. Samson, you can't, you just can't. <laughs> it's that easy. You just can't. Why, Mommy, why can't I celebrate Christmas? Because we don't. Why can't I do this or that? Because we don't. You know, why can't I go to the movies? Because we don't go to the movies, honey. Now, that child not going to the movies, you know what? That doesn't bring that child any closer to Jesus than me standing on my head and barking. Listen, it doesn't do anything for that kid. As an adult, if you believe that way, all well and good, because I would hope that you would have some cognitive understanding as to why you do what you do and why you don't do certain things. But that child could care less. They're just doing it because you said I'm supposed to do it this way, so they do it this way. And then what winds up happening as the years go by, they become like Samson, and after a while, they don't even know why they're doing half the stuff they're doing anymore. And it doesn't hold a whole lot of value. And they don't cherish it. They don't appreciate it anymore. They go to church, but they only go to church because, well, Mom and Dad went to church, so I go to church. But you know what, Lord? They're not going because they want to. Samson didn't cut his hair, and he lost sight of the fact of why he didn't cut his hair. Because God had established a special relationship with him before he was ever born, before he was conceived. And he lost sight of the fact that he had this very special relationship and that his goal ultimately was to be the beginning of deliverance for the people of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now listen in Judges 14, 5 and 6. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath, and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Did you hear me? It didn't say nothing about how long his hair was. It said the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. You see, he tore that lion like it was a goat. See, a goat couldn't hurt him much in the process of trying to 
to see it. But he tore that lion as if it were a goat with his bare hands, the Bible said. And how did he do it? He did it because the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. You see that, Mrs. Pentecostal, who's so worried about not cutting your hair for fear you might go to hell? It's not about his hair. It's about the Spirit of the Lord being upon him. Are you hearing me today, children? It's not about the accoutrements. It's not about the outsides. It's not about the rules and regulations. It's about having the Spirit of the Lord upon you. Hallelujah. In Judges 15, 9 through 17, we have another story of Samson. Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Rehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Now listen to this. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Hallelujah. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found the fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. And so it was, when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called the place Ramoth Lehi. Did you see both of those stories? Do you see where the glory goes? Do you see where the credit goes? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. <laughs> it wasn't about his magic locks. Many put, people put their faith in how they do things or how they look or what things they abstain from. It's a huge mistake, my friend, to confuse the length of your hair as being the source of your strength with the living God whom you are supposed to love and serve. Did you hear me? It's a sad thing when you get confused between the length of your hair and the God you serve. It's a sad thing when you get tied up in religion and lose sight of God. Because without God, what is religion but a futile, empty exercise? Notice how in each of these instances, Samson did something great, but he only did it as the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Then Samson winds up finding him a little trollop that he wants to flirt around with, and she wasn't the right girl for him to start with, and he should have known it. But boy, how we like to make the wrong decisions as human beings, don't we? And Delilah is obsessed with understanding what is the source of your strength, Samson? And what does Samson answer? Judges 16, 17, that he told her all his heart and said to her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any 
other man? Wrong answer, Samson. Amen, children, you hear me. He was putting his confidence in his religion rather than in his God. Samson, what helped you to slay the lion that day? Well, you see, I have never cut my hair. Samson, what helped you to kill a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass? Well, let me tell you, I have never cut my hair. No, Samson, it was not about your uncut hair. It was about your relationship with God. My Lord have mercy. I hope you're following me today. I know this is kind of a tough message to follow, but I hope you're following with me. I don't, we don't need folks just today who are so busy trying to follow the rudiments of religion that they have no relationship with the Master. What we think and how we think a lot of times doesn't even begin to compare with how God thinks. Amen. All the rules and regulations that we've embraced that are part of our religious thinking may not be even remotely close to what God is thinking. Look at the story that Paul tells in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, when he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning these things, I plead on, he says, with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he, the Lord, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect, in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am Strong. What was God saying? Paul was going to the Lord and saying, Lord, the devil has cut my hair. You hear me? He sent a messenger to torment me, to weaken me. And he's cut my hair. Please take this devil away. And the Lord responded and said, Paul, it's not about the length of your hair. It's about our relationship one with another. And my grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakest time, I'm the strongest. Hallelujah. So the rudiments of religion don't amount to a hill of beans in God's mindset because it bothered Paul, but it didn't bother God. Whew, you're following me today. I think this is good preaching, all things considered. Amen. Exodus 15 and 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. Nehemiah 8 and 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalms 18 and 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Who, where is the secret of your strength, Samson? You should have said, it's in my God. Hallelujah. It's not about whether or not I can try to act straight when I'm not. It's not about whether or not I can do this or I can do that. Oh, it's in my God. That's where my strength is. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, glory. 
Psalm 27 and 1, a psalm of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 28 and 8, the Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Psalm 37, 39, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. Psalm 93, verse 1, the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength so that it cannot be moved. Psalm 118, 14. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Guess what you find in Psalm 118, 14, if you look at it real careful. You've just read the name Jesus. Because in the Hebrew it says, The Lord is my strength and song. Jehovah is my strength and song. And he has, who has? Jehovah has become my salvation. What name translates Jehovah has become or is become my salvation? The name Jesus. Proverbs 10, 29, The way of the Lord is strength for the upright, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Isaiah 12 and 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Isaiah 26 and verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever, for in Him the Lord is everlasting strength. Isaiah 49 and 5, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him? For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. See, that's exactly what Samson did. He trusted in the flesh. He trusted in the religiosity. He trusted in the religious rudiments, and he lost contact with the God that he was supposed to have a relationship with. And if he had kept his relationship intact, then his strength would never have left him. Habakkuk 3.19, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. To, um, that, is, that is what the Word of God tells us about the strength that we have in God. That's what the Scripture tells us about the strength that we have in our relationship with the Master, okay? It's not in the length of your hair. It's not in the rules and regulations. It's not in what people will tell you you're supposed to do or not do in order to be saved. Amen. Samson is betrayed by Delilah, Judges 16, 18 through 21. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him, and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. It wasn't about the hair. 
It was about his relationship with the Lord. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. My Lord, have mercy. Samson, you've been betrayed. You went after this woman you shouldn't have gone for to begin with, and now you've been betrayed. Now you have no eyes. They poked out your eyes, and you're working in a grinding house. You had all your confidence in those locks, Samson. You had all your confidence in your hair. You had all your confidence in the things you thought you were doing so right. But you know what? Samson finally returned to the realization that his strength came not from his hair, but from his God. Because in Judges 16, verses 22 through 30, let's see how the story ends. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport, or he can entertain us. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that they held while Samson made sport. But listen now. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand, and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Do you know how much more you can do for God if you come to realize that it's not about the rules and regulations? It's about your relationship with the Master. Amen. Do you, do you know how much more you can do for God? The Bible says, Samson, he'd have done more if he'd have lived, but of course he pulled the house in on himself. You know, he, he brought the whole building down on top of himself. But he killed more that day than he had his entire life before. Samson had great possibilities for himself if he would have come to realize a whole lot sooner. Lord, it don't matter how long the hair is. Amen. It don't matter how long the hair is. It don't matter how many rules and regulations I'm following. That's not what's important. My relationship with you is what's important. And when he finally realized that and admitted and confessed that to God, the Bible said the Lord, once again, as he does for all of us, became his strength. And Samson was able to just pull that building right down in so that everybody in it died, including himself. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to be the strength of my life. I don't want to take my confidence and put it in. You know, I've tried that, Laura. I don't know about you, but I've tried that trying to be straight so I could satisfy. You know, I've tried that routine. I'll tell you what, I don't want to put my confidence in those foolish things. Whether or not I can do this, whether or not I can do that, no. My confidence is in the Lord because He is my strength. 
He is my help. He is my refuge. And he is my help in time of trouble. Amen. Would you stand with me today? I'm all done.